Hello, welcome to the innovation series. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about a subject called design thinking. And design thinking is something that has become quite a movement, not just in industry and entrepreneurship circles, but practically every sector. So I teach this every quarter uh, at Stanford and I teach not just students who are aspiring uh, entrepreneurs or designers, but also in executive education where some of the people in the class might be CEOs or senior management. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of versatility in this subject, so I hope I can communicate that uh, to you. So design thinking is a, is a term that's become very popular, uh, but where did it come from? And, and let's just look at a little bit of its history. So, so first of all, in order to understand design, and design thinking, let's look at what is design. And there's a very, very simple definition of design that, that was provided uh, by Herbert Simon, which is, it is the act of turning existing situ situations into preferred ones. So any time that you're turning something into something else and that the, the result is a preferred situation, you have uh, been engaged in an act of design. Now, the other word that gets used a whole lot is innovation. Now, innovation is, is something that is used in so many different contexts that it's really important to understand what is at the heart of innovation. The shortest definition that I've found for definition of, of defining innovation is change that creates value. But the way we look at innovation, it's, the, it's outperforming normative modes. So there are already ways in which people are trying to solve problems or trying to make changes, but how do you outperform them in order to create completely new behaviors or new outcomes or new ways of creating values or change a larger system in transform them such that the future looks very different, okay? Now, in the larger umbrella of innovation, there is this term called design thinking that represents simultaneously a mindset and also a methodology. So it is an approach. So it's an approach that doesn't just solve problems. It first figures out what problem to solve. So one of the fundamental aspects that it does is it goes about framing the problem in a creative manner and then generates highly innovative solutions, strategies, intervention pathways, and paradigms that are at the crossroads of different domains. So what are paradigms? Paradigms are ones, are solutions that are so frame-changing in their nature that they come and rewrite the rule books. So we place an emphasis on that kind of solution as well, particularly given the kind of challenges we are facing in, in Africa, we need paradigmatic solutions and these techniques such as design thinking come extremely handy in order to approach those, those really complex challenges. Now, one of the things that, that we believe as design thinkers, and we've been doing this for quite a, a while, it's a large community of us, and we've made a we've given a lot of value to industry and governments and so on doing these, using this technique, is that it lies at the intersection of technology, human needs, and business. That's where the magic, right at the center, is where the magic takes place. But there's a difference, typically, in industry, people come up with the technology, then figure out how to sell it, and then figure out what need it solves, and you kind of, they kind of try to push the technology or what have you. It could, could be a technology or it could be a service or what have you. But where we come from, we believe that it's very, very important to first understand the human needs, figure out the business and the, and the way economic systems that is going to support it, and then figure out what are the infrastructural or technological uh, uh, systems that need to support that, okay? Now, what is very, very interesting is that, that this way of thinking is emerging as an entirely new form of leadership. I have conversations with, with a lot of people who are in the business of thinking about what is the future of leadership, and these are deans of business schools, et cetera, and it's clear that that the nature of leadership is changing and the new kind of leadership is very much about the ability to create alternate futures, to create and catalyze and enable innovation and 
the ability to come up with very, very different kinds of solutions to intractable and difficult problems. And this capacity is something that is now turning out to be the future of leadership and is very, very closely tied to this methodology called design thinking. Now, what design thinking follows a certain arc. And I would like to point out that, uh, that there is a, there's a system to it. It's not just doodling and it's not just coming up with creative ideas. There's a system to it. And, and what we see out here is a framework where the x-axis is time. So this is the present and going into the future. And the y-axis represents a certain variation between whether something is extremely uh, uh, tangible and concrete or it's an abstract high-level point of view. Now, typically when there's a problem, uh, and that is, that is perceived to be a problem, the tendency is to think in terms of concrete solution and just march across uh, and, and keep it concrete. What we find is extremely valuable to do is to depart from the concrete for a while, go into an abstract realm, much more high level point of view and figure out what the strategy, high level strategy is and then create solutions in terms of something that has the potential of being much more leveraged. So the way the, the arc goes is that you first understand the problem and that involves many aspects of the problem but much, very, very importantly, the human elements of the problem. So there's a lot of, apart from other aspects of, of the problem, it is extremely important to understand the, uh, the behavioral aspects, the social aspects, what is going on in people's minds, etc. So the techniques you use out here are ethnograph is ethnography and going in and speaking to people and un trying to understand what's going on in their minds. Once you uh, generate that information, you do synthesis. Synthesis is different from analysis. Synthesis is, is essentially taking a step back and looking at many pieces of information and doing sense making in order to figure out what's really going on. And what falls out of those are the key insights. What are the key things that are going to drive your strategy? And way at the, at the abstract end, what you do is you come up with very, very clever and, and tight frameworks to define what's going on and, and, and generating a point of view about what it is that you aim to do at a high level. If you were to come up with a, with a good set of solutions, what would they do and, and what would they change? And based on that, what you derive are design principles and design levers. You know which, what things to push and pull so that theoretically that some, some uh, impact will be made. And that is how you frame the, the brainstorming and the, uh, the solution creation side of the equation where you ask these questions saying, how might we do X or how might we do Y? You, you frame the objectives in terms of how might we's and you do structured brainstorming to come up with many different options. And I'm throwing out these tools and we will have modules on all of these. And that's when you populate a space with many, many solutions. So you come up with many solutions and then you test them, you prototype them, you test them, and you iterate through your way, uh, your way uh, in, into solutions that are more robust. So that's the very you know, quick and high level view. But the other thing that is happening is that in design thinking, you're alternating between two different points of view or modes of thinking. So this is divergent thinking, which means that given one question, you're instead of just uh, uh, coming up with one answer, you're coming up with a multitude of answers. So you're populating a space with many, many possibilities. And then having, having come up with many, many options, instead of just falling out in love with the first uh, 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 idea that you have, you come up with many ideas and then let them fight with each other to see which is the best idea. And then you pivot and you converge down and pick the idea that makes sense. And this is, we have found, is a far, far more beneficial way of coming up with a good idea because it takes out the failure mode of, the, of a creativity bias where the person who is coming up with the idea thinks that it the, the, is the best idea 
uh, you know, and uh, ever, and thinks that it, it is just going to be to change everything. And if you come up with a large number of ideas, then there is a certain level of objectivity, and you also have the ability to to take some features from some ideas and some other features from some others and make them into coming up with a nice combinatorial uh, answer. So, and and of course, this is happening in sequence. So you given a certain position. You come up with many ideas, you converge down to one position, and then you, in the next level of refinement or, or higher level of fidelity, you come out and, and, and go out again, you pivot again, and go diverging. Okay? Now, what is happening out here is a very, very important distinction between design thinking and, and business as usual. Typically, in business as usual, you figure out what the problem is, cast the problem in stone, and then try to solve it. We believe that you don't really know what the problem is. No one knows what the problem is. They just think they know what the problem is. And it's the act of trying to solve it that tells you what the problem really is. So we use, in design thinking, we use the act of trying to solve the problem iteratively, almost as a probe to figure out what the problem really is. So we are innovating on the problem domain in trying to frame the problem creatively. And then we are also innovating on the solution domain so that we can make use of scarce resources with disproportionate effect. But what we are doing is we are going back and forth between these because we are iterating. And what we are finding out from a, the early tests or an early prototype of a, of a, of a solution is changing our minds about what the problem really is because that's where we are finding out new information. And as we are going up, the fidelity of our understanding of the problem side and the solution side are marching lockstep so that you don't spend a lot of time and money doing something and then you find out that it's not working or it's suboptimal, but it's too expensive to change because you've invested too much in it. So this is a very profound difference. And ultimately what is happening is that one is, through the, through the ethnography one is doing, through going out into the field, really looking under the surface, one is generating very, very important insights. From those insights, you're allowing yourself and your team and your organization to reframe what the problem is. You might have thought the problem is this, but now you're allowing yourself to reframe the problem because very often, the magic lies in reframing the problem. And then you're coming up with many concepts and many prototypes in order to generate more insights about what is really going to work. And the moment you test it, you get more insights, and it goes around like that. But the reason why there's a question mark in the middle is that it's super important. I cannot emphasize more as to how important this is, that you do not mistake what the real question is. So for example, if somebody tells you to come in and design an incubator that is cheaper for all the children who are born premature and they need, to, they need a, a certain kind of care in the first few days, and someone says the incubators are very expensive, how, can you please design us a cheaper incubator? The right question to ask is not, how to design a cheaper incubator. The real question to ask is how to keep babies alive. Because if you, how, you ask the question, how do we keep premature babies alive, then you might come up with a very, very different type of answer that might not look at all like an incubator. And you might actually find ways of coming up with a solution like something like a blanket or a sleeping bag or some such thing that might be a small fraction of the cost of a modern day incubator. Okay, now I want to tell you about what the essence of design thinking is. This slide depicts the, what's going on really under the hood, the, the heart of the matter, which is you, you do those activities such as ethnography, going out into the field, speaking to a lot of people, understanding the relationships, understanding what's going on in people's minds, really to get at the, the insights the really deep, hard to see insights and the causal uh, ch chains that are going to drive your decisions. Having found those uh, insights, you want to use those 
in order to reframe what the problem is. Because you've gone into the task thinking that you know what the problem is, but you found out new insights, and that ought to allow you and your team and your organization to reframe what the problem is. Having reframed the problem in terms of the reframe, you generate a whole lot of uh, uh, ideas and, and prototype the ideas, and the act of prototyping allows you to integrate the ideas into, into a solution, however crude, which you can then test. And the moment you test, you get insights, and the cycle goes on iteratively, and you learn more and more about the problem side and the solution side of the equation. But a very important, uh, and, and I cannot emphasize this more, the most important thing is to not ask the wrong question. It is, so if someone tells you that you're, uh, that you're supposed to design an incubator that's cheaper because there are all these premature babies that are at risk and they would die without, and the standard way of treating them are incubators, but incubators are very expensive, and it's very hard to uh, have all, uh, a highly distributed community have access to those, those incubators. They might have a theory of success that says, if we build cheaper incubators, then, then this problem will go away. But by having given them, giving, given you their brief saying, make cheaper incubators, they have locked you into their theory of success. But if you ask a different question, as opposed to saying, how can we design a cheaper incubator? If you ask a different question, such as how do we keep premature babies alive? you might actually come up with a completely different solution that is, looks very different from a standard incubator, and you might have come up with a new paradigm. So you might actually have come up with something that looks like a sleeping bag or a, or a blanket that is warmed up or some such thing, which could be done at a fraction of the cost of, of the, the cheapest incubator that can be built. And that is the why you ask the fundamental question at the center. I'll close with the module there. Thank you.